Welcome everyone to this IUCN WCPA Vital Sites event, Inclusive Conservation Tools in Sierra de Guadarrama, Guadarrama National Park, Spain. Uh, we're just waiting for all of our attendees to dial in from across the world. So we'll start in a minute and I will then pass you on to our Master of Ceremonies, Alberto. So I think we've uh, got a stable number of uh, participants. Everyone's in, so uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Rochir. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar on inclusive conservation tools in Sierra de Guadarrama National Park, Spain. My name is Alberto Arroyo Schnell. I'm the senior policy manager at the IUCN European Regional Office and I will be helping with the moderation of this event. Many thanks to our colleague, Rusir Sarma, for the introduction and for hosting this event in the context of the Vital Sites series. Today, we have an interesting, exciting discussion ahead. We will introduce you to the Sierra de Guadarrama Panorama Solution National Park, and we will present a set of tools to identify, compare, and to balance different views, visions for protected area management to move towards a better social engagement in conservation governance. Let me just start with some housekeeping rules. Please use the chat to network, to comment, and please first identify yourselves. There will also be a Q&A session at the end of the event. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box that you can see below. The event is being recorded and the recording of the event will be available on the IUCN YouTube channel. Also, as this is a Panorama webinar, Panorama Solutions. I will now give the floor to Cecile Fatebert, Program Officer and Solutions for the IUCN Global Program on Protected Areas, who will briefly introduce you to Panorama. Cecile, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alberto. And hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. So I'm going to first share the screen. Can you see it well? Yes, very well. Thank you. So Panorama is a partnership initiative that actually documents and promotes good practices from around the world and on very different topics. And it's, it, we do that to promote peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. Uh, the partners are all from development and conservation work and the solutions that we promote, the good practices that we promote are um, contributes to global policy goals. And the, we are also leading an online uh, open access database of these solutions. The solutions are classified in uh, 11 thematic communities and almost soon there will be 12 on very key topics for conservation and sustainable development and they are all uh, coordinated by the different partners they will receive the solutions that are submitted and curate them that means they go through a review process and then it's published online where it's accessible to to the public so now what we mean by solutions, uh, solutions are tools or approaches, processes, sets of activities that have proven successful impact and they are also replicable and scalable and they address conservation, both conservation and development challenges. As of uh, la at the beginning of the year, we have around 800 of these solutions from uh, for 570 uh, providers from 117 countries. 
So how does it work? So the idea is that the successful practices that are uh, implemented locally, they can inspire potentially others uh, around the globe and um, who are facing similar challenges. So the, the solution provider will also self-reflect a little bit on, on, on what is the success, but also why. So what are the success factors that we call actually building blocks of their solution? And it's like providing some recipe of success to others who can say, oh, this, so these factors or these key elements can be uh, interesting for us. We can, we can maybe integrate this in our activities. So this is a bit the idea behind the, the, the sharing on the Panorama platform. Uh, Panorama is not only the online pl platform, so that the, the open access portfolio of good, of good practices, but it also, uh, we also developed a methodology for peer-to-peer -peer learning exchange based on different solutions that are available, but like identifying uh, how these different key success factors could be integrated in others' practices. And we also promote solutions on different communication channels. It can be uh, newsletters or webinars like today, uh, but it can also be uh, through publication when we, we can make, for example, analysis on, on uh, contribution of the, uh, we, we can show how solutions on the ground can influence policy uh, level discussions, for example. And to end the presentation is just some uh, webinar statistics. So from last year, as you can see, we have a, a, an increasing number of uh, visits on the website. So these are the statistics from the, the activity on the website. Uh, so 117 different countries are represented from almost all the regions uh, of the world with North America, South America, and um, Asia, which are mostly represented throughout the platform. We also get an increase of uh, new solutions every year. I'm happy to answer any question if you may have, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Cecil, for introducing us to Panorama. As you see, this is a recipe for success, and this is what we are going to do now, to learn about what has happened during the past years in the, Sierra Nacional, in the Parque Nacional of Sierra de Guadarrama in Spain, and this is in the context of the Envision project. We will have a number of uh, colleagues from the Envision project at the very moment that could help us uh, to make understand how this has really been a success. And uh, I'm going to pass the word quickly, simply to Chris Christopher Raymond, he's the coordinator of the Envision project. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alberto, and welcome everyone to this webinar today. Um, share my screen here. Presentation, right? Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so as Alberto mentioned, I am the coordinator of the Envision project, which is working in Chirago de Guatemala region, as well as other parts of the world. Um, and Envision is, uh, is all about how to develop more inclusive approaches to protected area management to improve biodiversity and wellbeing. Um, why do we want to look at inclusive conservation? One of the reasons is that protected areas globally are facing multiple pressures from mining, from governance, from climate change, to forestry, tourism, land use change, etc. Um, and so there are competing pressures on natural resources. Uh, and somehow we have to engage with diverse visions and uses of these areas and to look at how we can manage trade-offs in new ways. And uh, there are different divisions exist for protected areas, as highlighted in a paper by Mason 2014, including nature for people, nature for itself, nature despite people, 
and a more balanced perspective where people and nature are considered together. And each of these have different assumptions around what values we prioritise in protected area management. In Envision, we very much emphasise this uh, understanding of inclusive conservation. We want to try to consider multiple visions and scenarios for protected area management that are seek to balance society, environmental and economic goals to not only improve biodiversity and human well-being, but also can connect people to development of protected area policies and practices. And this is uh, quite a large project, it involves uh, SLU or Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences coordinator, but a range of university institutions as featured here, together with uh, communications companies like Science Seed, in addition to a range of national funders, all supported through Biodiversa and Belmont Forum and European Commission funding. And at the heart of our inclusive conservation approach is six key areas. How do we consider multiple visions for protected area management? How do we assess the consequences of each vision? How do we foster social learning and collectively define new visions? How do we assess uncertainty and build resilience? How do we acknowledge power relations and rethink governance? And to collectively, how can the results of these different phases inform biodiversity and protected area management policy? And we do this in partnership with local site knowledge alliances across our four study areas, oh, sorry, within our four study areas, as well as across our four study areas through our intersite knowledge alliance. And in addition to Sierra de Guatemala, we have Denali National Park, Rastahaga, and Cromer Rhine, representing a spectrum of study areas from more urban protected areas like uh, the Netherlands through to wilderness areas like Denali in Alaska. And I won't go into detail about methodologies, but suffice to say there are a range of different methodologies we're employing to engage diverse groups in protected area management, ranging from the mixed method approaches through to more qualitative and quantitative approaches, each linked to the different actions in the Envision project. So that's a short overview of the project. I encourage you to find out uh, more about the project through our website, which is www.inclusiveconservation.org. Uh, and there you can see not only our methodologies and case study areas, but the range of impacts that we are achieving through this project. So thank you very much. And back to you, Alberto. Thank you very much, Chris, for this overview of the Ambition project. I'm now going to share my screen just to show you the agenda of what is coming right now. What you will have now is some presentations from different colleagues from Envision. And uh, we will start right away with our colleague, Maria Dolores Lopez Rodriguez, who is going to tell us about the panorama solution of the Sierra de Guadarrama National Park. Maria Dolores, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Alberto. I'm going to share my screen. Please, can you tell me if you can see? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. One second, I think. coming okay now okay yes <laughs> okay thank you Although so, the, uh, there's a a couple of uh, blank spaces where your uh, control panel is that's black blanked out unfortunately could okay. you just, could you just try hitting the share button again and okay. you'll, see, you'll see a button that says uh, optimize screen sharing for video clip that might help Okay. Great. Now? Yes. Okay, it's better. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, hello and welcome everyone to our webinar. First, uh, I would like to say that um, 
And I would like to express my gratitude at uh, being given the opportunity to to speak here uh, today. Um, I will. I, I want to give a special thank you to all ICN colleagues for hosting the meeting and, and for hosting and coordinating the, the webinar, and especially to all the ambition members that uh, are participating in the webinar as well. So, well, the aim of my presentation is to make a general introduction about uh, the decision-making toolbox that we have uh, developed uh, in Sierra de Guadarrama National Park through the ambition projects of, um, that um, the aim of this uh, toolbox is to provide practical guidance uh, to create socially inclusive policies and um, actions within the protected areas. So first, uh, well, of course, as uh, uh, Elisa Cecil mentioned, this uh, decisions making toolbox uh, is available at the Panorama Solution website, so you can read uh, that. Um, uh, to start my presentation, uh, I'll first uh, introduce briefly the Sierra de Guadarrama National Park as a case uh, study, so you can better understand uh, the different challenges uh, that the toolbox uh, is intended uh, to address. After that, I'll explain briefly how the toolbox has been developed and what is the main structure. And um, after them, uh, we'll have uh, three consecutive presentations in which uh, other ambition colleagues, uh, Miguel, Veronica, and I, will explain more later, in more detail, uh, the different tools that comprises this uh, toolbox. So. To start the presentation, well, this is the, the, the general uh, location of the Sierra de Guadarrama National Park. This uh, national park is um, located on the um, central mountain system of the peninsula, in, of the Iberian Peninsula, sorry. And this national park covers uh, almost 34,000 uh, hectares across two regions, uh, Madrid and Castilla y León. So this, uh, it's a governance model of management system is shared by two um, different regional governments. Um, the Sierra de Guadarrama National Park, it was established in 2013 to um, protect uh, the natural capital and ecosystem of these uh, regions, and it is becoming the newest uh, national park uh, in Spain. Um, future of this area of this national park is, 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 uh, it, um, is surrounded by multiple um, protected areas that has uh, different protection regimes. Uh, one of them is an area of a special uh, of protection that uh, is overseen by a national state administration, but uh, there are also another peripheral area of protection comprises of uh, 34 municipalities, with uh, uh, most of them uh, intersecting with the Cobre National Park. In addition, in this uh, area, we can find two UNESCO Biosphere Reserve and also two regional protected areas. Regarding the um, in Sierra de Guadarrama National Park, the main ecosystem you can see on, on the slide includes the formation and relief of mountain and high mountains. Uh, Peñalara is the highest one, but you can find we can find also uh, glacier cycles, unique uh, granite uh, rock formation, uh, alpine lakes, uh, grassland, pastures, um, pine forests. This uh, mountain area um, serves as a refuge uh, for biodiversity conservation, uh, housing autochthonous and diverse uh, species of, of plants and animals. So for centuries, uh, this area have attracted uh, the interest of scientists, uh, um, intellectuals, uh, kings, so this has a result that the area, uh, there is a wealth of historical studies and cultural heritage. Uh, traditionally, uh, the predominance and uh, less use in this uh, area include uh, livestock farming and pine wood uh, timber lodging. And these traditional uses um, played a key role for conservation biodiversity. So, but uh, covering over the past, um, however, over the past uh, few decades, this area has changed uh, through bilateral process um, of uh, rural of intensification and rural abandonment. So, and um, currently, 
we can see that uh, one of the main features of this um, national park is its proximity to the major city of uh, Madrid that uh, is located uh, less than 100 kilometers. As you know, uh, Madrid is a large uh, metropolitan area with uh, over 6 million uh, inhabitants. So this made that this national park has almost uh, 3 million visitors uh, per year. So uh, one of the challenges is that uh, whereas uh, these park visitors um, are interested uh, mainly in recreation and uh, outdoor sport activities in this national park, at the same time, there are uh, multiple stakeholders engaging in other activities such as uh, livestock farming, education, research, and even includes, um, environmental conservation. Caroline, this uh, another challenge of this uh, national park is the climate change that is impacting on snow, um, water availability, and um, also in species ranches. So, uh, sorry. Now, so um, in this context, uh, um, the conservation authorities of the Sierra de Guadarrama National Park uh, to achieve the conservation target of this uh, area, they deal with a variety of uh, purposes from state and not state uh, actors. As I mentioned previously, in Sierra de Guadarrama, there are multiple uh, state administration at different decisions making scales uh, with governing competence uh, in this uh, national park, but there are also uh, multiple stakeholders uh, interested in different uh, activities. So, uh, as in other protected areas, uh, this made that uh, one of the main challenges in Sierra de Guadarrama National Park is how the different visions, values, knowledge, and power relation between these stakeholders can be considered and balanced for achieving positive uh, conservation outcome. And this is the challenge that uh, we pretend to, to address with the toolbox that we have developed uh, through the, the ambition. So this, uh, the aim of the decision-making toolbox is provide practical guidance uh, to help decision makers to identify, compare, and balance a stakeholder vision for protected areas management and also foster engagement and collaboration for achieving better conservation outcomes. So in addition that uh, this toolbox can be useful for decision makers, we thought that uh, stakeholders, uh, local communities uh, can also benefit from these tools. The sign this toolbox can help or can facilitate their participation in protected areas uh, management. So, of course, um, this toolbox can be adapted and used uh, by other practitioners and decision makers in other protected areas uh, around the world. And to develop the, um, this toolbox, uh, three ambition teams have been conducting research in Sierra de Guadarrama um, um, for several years, from 2019. Um, one of the teams is uh, the Swedish uh, University of Agricultural Science that is composed by Veronica Lowe, Mark Mercer, of Christopher Raymond. And the research has mainly focused on exploring linkages between vision and values. Other team is the uh, University of Göttingen in, German, in Germany, that uh, is composed by Miguel Sebrián and Tobias uh, Plininger. And their research has been focused mainly on exploring uh, social ecological interaction and local ecology, ecological knowledge. And finally, is uh, the team of the Universidad Oberta de Catalonia in, in Spain, whose researchers are uh, Elisa de los Rozas, uh, Hugo Marx, Isabel Ruiz Madien, and I. Um, our research uh, has been mainly focused on under, uh, understanding how, um, well, understanding the governance systems um, in order to identify challenges and opportunities. To, fo to foster social engagement in decision making. Um, as part of our activities, we, we have developing um, the, we all, one of our goals is to develop this uh, decision making toolbox. Um, uh, in addition to this, um, the, the research team, 
I would like to highlight that we have uh, received uh, important uh, support and contribution to develop the toolbox at the rest of the, uh, all the of research activities from the management units of the Sierra de Guadarrama uh, National Park, especially from Judith Maroto, um, feedback from her and other decision makers uh, in this national park uh, help us to identify um, management needs and challenges in, in this national park in order to align or better uh, was, or ensure that our ambition researchers can better respond to these challenges and these and needs in this national park. Uh, regarding the methodological approach that we as uh, we uh, use uh, to develop the thing, the um, the decision making toolbox will include a variety and wide variety of methods and means of data collection. You can see a summary on of the slide. For example, we have review policy documents, uh, management plans, uh, legal norms, and we have conducting uh, newspaper research, uh, library, library research. We also have conducted semi structured interviews with uh, representative of um, institution, collective, and individuals with at stake uh, in the um, governance system of this national park. Also, we have conducted face to face and online surveys to both residents and local stakeholders. Last year, uh, we developed uh, virtual workshops uh, focused on the laboratory processes using and combining different methodologies. And our methodological approach also includes the development of oral histories and historical, historical reviews. Um, simultaneously to our research uh, activities, uh, from the beginning of the ambition, we have uh, developed science um, policy activities in order to try to engage um, local communities, but especially decision makers uh, in our research. So as part of uh, these uh, activities, we have developed a uh, newsletter in local language, uh, we have writing blogs, uh, we have participated in conference, um, we have elaborated uh, regular reports to disseminate or research activities uh, or finding before um, article publication and to also to inform about uh, project advanced. Uh, I would like to, um, regarding the um, Decision making toolbox, uh, we are especially focused on uh, to create a thrust and understanding with the uh, decision maker. Um, we have uh, developed a regular meeting with, with them, and especially once uh, we apply all research tools in Guadarrama, we develop a workshop with the decision maker in order they could assess the applicability of all the ambition research tools in terms of usability uh, and applicability within the management cycle. So according to, to the feedback uh, received from them, we adapted uh, the, these tools and we could identify special challenges and needs uh, related to this uh, management system. Um, well, in order to ensure that um, these tools can respond or can serve to, to, make, to be used uh, by them. And to, final my, to finalize my presentation, I would like to, 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 to explain briefly how, what is the general structure of this uh, decision making toolbox. So as you can see, the decisions making toolbox is comprised uh, by, uh, is comprised of uh, four uh, building, different building blocks uh, that uh, in tour, um, include a set of different tools. So the first one is um, the building block is uh, focused or, or include a set of, of tools to gather local knowledge and values. This um, building block will be explained in more detail by Miguel in the next uh, presentation. The next uh, building block uh, includes uh, a set of methodologies to elucidate vision and future scenarios for park uh, management. This building block will be explain, explained by Veronica later. And the third building block um, includes a set of tools um, for addressing power dynamics and promoting engagement in collective action. I'll introduce in more detail this building block uh, during my next presentation. 
Um, to finish, only to say that uh, uh, there are another pending blocks that the name is uh, Strengthening the Science Policy Interface for Social Inclusive Governance. And here you can find on the Panorama Solution website the different activities that I mentioned previously that we have developed through the ambition to, uh, to create uh, trust and understanding between us, the researchers and the decision maker, in order that all research can be useful by them and can reach impact uh, on the policy domain. So that's all from my side, Alberto. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. That was very useful to learn about how the Panorama Solution has worked exactly for this particular site. And now this will be followed, as Maria has said, by three presentations, one after the other, presenting different elements of these particular solutions. The first one will be local knowledge and values. That will be the focus from Miguel Angel Cebrian Piqueras, postdoctoral researcher at Envision and chair of social ecological interactions in agricultural systems from the Göttingen University in Germany. The second one will be about the future scenarios for, for park management from Veronica Lowe, also from Envision, the Envision project manager actually and researcher, Department of Landscape Architecture, Planning and Management at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. And finally, Maria will come back again to present us the power dynamics and engagement in collective action. So the three presentations will now come one after the other. Please, Miguel Angel, you can start. The floor is yes. yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Great. we can hear you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, it's for me a pleasure to be here to showcase this, this wonderful toolbox um, that we have been developing with um, many people involved here from the IUCN, Panorama, developers. Also, I would like to thank also my colleagues from Sierra, which have been on site, uh, Maria and Veronica, for this. It has been a pleasure to work with them. And, and yes, um, here we want to present um, um, first, um, I will present the, the, the first building block. Maria has already been saying some information about this. We got four of them uh, in relation to the first one um, during the first year of collaboration. We gathered information of the local knowledge and values to understand the social ecological context of Sierra de Guadarrama. Uh, this information was important to start um, thinking of the place-based processes that may uh, foster inclusive conservation on site. And in relation to this and uh, concerning this, um, this building block, we got several, um, we got several tools and methods that were employed um, at the beginning of the project um, in order to elucidate knowledge, values, and perception from um, both local communities and stakeholders working in the area. And for example, we, we ran some, some in-depth interviews. Already Maria said something about this with local stakeholders to understand uh, how participation works among others. Uh, also uh, work made by, by Veronica about perceptions of driver of change among uh, many other aspects. Um, Besides that, we, we run some face-to-face -face service with the specific for local population. And the main focus was to, to gather local ecological knowledge, more, uh, both uh, more local, both um, uh, scientific ecological knowledge, but many other aspects uh, that I will explain later. Uh, besides that, we, we run also online service with local stakeholders. Um, in time uh, during the time of the pandemic, um, and we also used that to to elicit what was the impact, in fact, from this uh, pandemic on different values and views of nature conservation. Besides that, um, we celebrate one one workshop last year to to use a deliberative process, and and then we employ some methods like cognitive and emotional maps. Uh, now, what we are planning for this year is to, to run some oral histories and historical data sets review um, in order to reconstruct some past visions of how uh, these nature uh, conservation visions have changed during the, uh, the last uh, past 50 years. Um, uh, specifically, I will focus now in this tool, face-to-face -to -face service to residents, just to give you an example of what we have been doing. Um, we employed several techniques for this uh, survey with local population, like Likert scales, participatory mapping, photo elicitation, open questions, free listing, and so on. 
And this was possible because we integrate all these methodologies and techniques within one single platform, which was Maptionaire in this case. And um, it was uh, integrated in every aspect, like this, like a scale. There was also um, the potential of using participatory mapping and, and, and things like that. And the, the topics that uh, we were focusing on this uh, very extensive and long um, survey with local population were different and multiple and very rich from local and scientific uh, ecological knowledge of local communities and also attitudes and behavior for nature conservation, also perceptions uh, for ecosystem service supply and perceptions of inclusive conservation, but also we try to elicit what are the relational values, how people connect to nature. And, and this is something that has been partly analyzed and some of the results have been made available to the, to the, to the local uh, population and the stakeholders. Um, this work was made during, uh, this data and information was collected during September and October in 2019 in different municipalities of Sierra de Guadarrama, both sides, north and south, and in the area of influence of the national park. And it was possible because we built a network of uh, 12 local collaborators from site who run the surveys. They were, uh, they were um, uh, engaged from the beginning and they were, um, they were instructed to do that. And it was possible because the duration of the service was um, quite, quite long, like, uh, between one and two hours, everyone. And we reached a, a sample size of 300 uh, local residents from, from all sides of the Sierra de Guadarrama. And yes, as um, for this um, specific tool, uh, we, we identified several enabling factors which are relevant, for example, creating an atmosphere of respect, respect and trust with participants was um, essential. And also building this network of several local collaborators working in their sites, in their areas and in municipalities was extremely helpful to, to, prom to promote trust and to, and to, to increase the response rates. But also explaining clearly the, the project goals, the practical outcomes that uh, we were expecting and uh, uh, to manage expectation and st uh, stimulate participation was also identified as very relevant. Mm. In relation to what we have learned from, from, this, um, from this tool and, and methods is that, um, for example, adaptation of the communication language was really important to the specific context in uh, education of the respondents. Um, also, maybe it's not here written, but also in piloting the, the, the surveys before in a couple of months before really uh, launch, uh, launching that was extremely helpful. And to, to, to improve the quality of the, uh, and the response rates, that was really helpful. Also planning the meeting with the respondents instead of um, catching people in the streets because uh, the, the service were really long. This would facilitate what much the responses. And we employ one um, sort of mixed method approach based on qualitative and, quali and quantitative data. And also this helped a lot to, to understand more in depth um, with a more in-depth knowledge, the, the context of the, the area, the social ecological context. Finally, synthesizing and sharing the knowledge uh, that we have co-created co with, with the respondents was appreciated by stakeholders and, and respondents. And yeah, this, these were some specific lessons learned and enable factors for the, this specific tool. If you want to find more of this information for the other um, set of tools, you can just simply uh, check uh, the website and you will find more information and we are happy to share with you. Um, yeah, that was uh, from my side in relation to this uh, building block and this specific tool. Um, thank you very much for your attention and yeah, we are happy to, to work in this uh, uh, very, very enriched uh, collaboration with the IUCN and Panorama developers. Thanks. And now, um, uh, Veronica, please. Great, thank you, Miguel. Okay, now I have my, my slides up and that's visible, is that right? Yep. Yes. Okay, 
So thank you. Um, I also express my appreciation for being able to um, join this webinar and explain um, some of our research uh, with regard to building block two. So thank you to IUC and colleagues and of course our Guadalama teammates um, for uh, facilitating this, this opportunity. Uh, so this building block um, is focused on elucidating visions and scenarios for uh, park management. And um, if you just give me a second, I try to move the slides forward. I have a little bit of problem with the uh, slide advancement, but there. Okay, so let's begin with how do we actually elicit visions and scenarios um, in the Envision project. So we have um, done this in various ways, including in participatory mapping. Miguel has just um, spoke about this and uh, Maria has also gone through some of the different techniques that we've used. But we've also had um, stakeholder interviews and a participatory scenario planning process. So the focus of this presentation is the use of Streamline, which is a graphic tool which helps to complement these methods, um, particularly with, um, with regards to, to visioning. And maybe for our audience, we need a, just a bit of a backgrounder on what exactly is participatory scenario planning. Why do we use it? Um, you know, why should we care about them? And what is the difference between a scenario and uh, and a vision? Or are they the same thing? So there's different um, definitions, but simply put, uh, participatory scenario planning is a stakeholder process for exploring alternative futures for management considerations. Um, and there are different kinds of uh, scenarios and the participatory nature emphasizes, of course, local values and preferences. So hence, PSP is seen as a bottom-up approach for managing complex social ecological systems, such as the case of the Sierra de Guadarrama National Park. Um, so the um, main kinds of scenarios that you might consider include exploratory scenarios, um, which are about what could happen in the future. So there are um, different plausible futures. And normative scenarios, which are equivalent to visions, um, describe what should happen in the future. So the work I'm describing here is particularly focused on visions, which can be greatly relevant to decision makers and stakeholders as they focus on a set of desired futures. And the questions that we were interested in um, in this research are how are um, values that stakeholders derive from the landscape related to these different visions and how are they related to drivers of change and additionally how stable are these visions in the face of disturbances and system shocks so we sought to explore this and I'll explain the, the methodologies here our approach involved different phases um, first we reviewed the literature so that we could understand uh, different uh, uh, what different landscape impacts and, um, and changes have been documented in the literature. And from there, we could design our research. Um, in the first phase, it was in fall of 2019, we conducted visioning interviews with 38 uh, stakeholders. And there were semi-structured interviews uh, incorporating elements, visual elements, which I'll describe um, later on. And then we uh, coded these interviews and we could derive major um, vision themes from this analysis. And then we went back to stakeholders the following year in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and we issued a follow-up survey where we asked stakeholders to reflect on their visions and their values. And we asked them if anything had changed as a result of the pandemic uh, with respect to their values and their visions and management preferences. Um, and we analyzed that data through a qualitative data uh, analysis. So here I begin to describe uh, more about Streamline, uh, which is an open source cartoon visualization tool. It's highly flexible, user friendly and adaptable to different contexts. It was developed uh, by Astrid de Vries Lynch and Mark Metzger a couple of years ago, and it's been already applied um, in Europe, uh, for example, in land use planning workshops. So that's an example of a scenario that was constructed using Streamline. And with Streamline, we were able to customize it um, so that we could adapt it to the context the, of the Sierra de Guadarrama. And this is just an example of a stylized map that was developed by a local company. And we use this as a backdrop um, so that we could help to facilitate the semi-structured interviews and build and construct uh, visions um, in this way. So I'll walk you through the process through which we elicit visions from stakeholders. Uh, we first 
asked them, well, what values do you derive from the landscape? And stakeholders were asked to rank uh, on a scale of one to five, the different kinds of values that they derived from the landscape, whether it was the clean air and water, um, the landscape beauty, the ability to socialize and form bonds and social connections with others, uh, or perhaps the existence value independent of any benefits to, to a particular stakeholder. Um, then we asked them, well, if you have this landscape, what do you feel are the most important ecosystem services? And we used the framework of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment with provisioning and cultural um, and regulating ecosystem services. And you can see with Streamline here that you can customize the tiles. Uh, we call them tiles here. And each one had a small picture depicting what an ecosystem service could be. And what a stakeholder could do is to move them physically on this canvas backdrop. So it was an interactive element that um, enabled some creative thinking. And we repeated the same with management activities. And we also asked them, well, now we understand your visions, your, your values, and we understand the different kinds of ecosystem services that you value. Um, what activities would you permit in the park? And here's an example of the canvas that we used. And again, here we customize the tiles to be representative of the actual activities that are happening um, in the park or the range of uh, possible activities. And here's an example of the canvas filled out with all these different examples of uses, mountain biking, um, mushroom collection, hiking, running. And there are some examples of what stakeholders would not like to see, such as more parking lots, overnight camping, more hotels, et cetera. And we also had blank um, squares so that the participants or stakeholders could actually fill in any particular activity or component, ecosystem service or value that they felt was missing from the available list. And so what we did was take the resulting interviews and we had them transcribed, the audio recordings were transcribed, and we used a process called inductive thematic analysis to derive the major themes associated with these different visions. And this was done in an iterative process and it resulted in four main vision themes. Um, one, I'll describe them briefly just in the interest of time, but one was integrated management, um, which is the focus on um, the Sierra de Guanarama as a multifunctional space with areas managed for nature protection, but also allowing agriculture, timber harvesting, hard and soft recreation. But there was also a subset of stakeholders that emphasized cultural roots and um, the landscape as a means for providing local economic benefits and restoring traditional uses. Uh, so for example, integrating livestock farming into management plans um, and integrating grazing, for example, to prevent fire risk and to maintain traditional hydrological regimes. And some stakeholders thought of the Sierra de Guadarrama as a prescription for health and well-being in the sense that the landscape um, is absolutely vital to providing clean air and water to the surrounding population. And the forests are recognized and managing and managed for absorbing carbon to help mitigate climate change. Whereas local food products provide uh, local economic benefits. And then there was also a group of stakeholders that really emphasized uh, biodiversity protection of the unique um, biodiversity and endemic species in the park and felt strongly about, um, about enhancing nature protection measures. So if you take a look at the different visions, we looked at the um, values across the four different types of visions, the landscape changes, um, perceptions of drivers of change. And what we found was that across the four different vision themes, landscape values were strikingly similar. And again, there were not many diverging perspectives on perceptions of landscape changes. Where there were differences were in the way that stakeholders perceived different drivers of those landscape changes. So for example, in the nat natural heritage um, vision, you can see that's outlined by green here. You could see if, if you rank on a scale of one to five, the importance, the perceived importance of different drivers of change. Um, some stakeholders in the natural heritage group thought that mountain recreation and mass tourism were driving um, many of the impacts and changes in the landscape. 
And as I mentioned, we had a second phase of the research where we revisited stakeholders and we asked them to reflect on any changes to their visions or their values um, be, uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. And if you take a look at the different visions that you have, you can see, see them situated on two different competing axes of biodiversity conservation and economic productivity. And so what we found from the interview results or the survey results were that the visions were largely stable. And that was quite surprising in the face of such a, um, in the face of such a large system shock, such as a pandemic. But where there were any changes, um, it was more in the way that people perceived the impacts on uh, the park as a result of heightened visitation in different phases of the of the pandemic. So just some um, some explanations by certain stakeholders to help to illustrate this point. Some felt that their values and visions had been reaffirmed. Some felt that there had been many more accidents and since um, the, the park uh, was available to, um, to visit during the pandemic when many other things were closed. And then others commented on how the pandemic can influence future park management towards enhancing protection zoning in areas of uh, public use. And this is what these arrows demonstrate that the visions of cultural roots and integrated management are shifted closer towards the axis of prioritizing biodiversity conservation than in the situation uh, prior to the pandemic. So some headline conclusions, uh, so I don't take up too much time. Uh, we found that differences in visions were largely spurred by different perceptions of drivers of change rather than differences in values or differences in the way that landscape changes were perceived. And that the visions were largely stable during the pandemic, but there was uh, some perceived importance of enhanced protection measures as a result of enhanced uh, increased visitation. So what this implies is that potentially management plans, if they're integrated on stakeholder values, they have the potential to stay relevant even in the face of such large scale disturbances. But that such management plans and indeed scenario planning methodologies in general should more strongly consider how different drivers of change can be affected by wildcard events. And the streamlined graphic tool that we used proved to be a low tech, highly customizable, affordable and flexible tool which is very useful given that scenario planning processes can be very time intensive and labor intensive and can require certain skills. And so the streamline was very helpful in that end and we had to adapt it towards a virtual use as well during the pandemic. And I'll just walk you through a few enabling factors um, that we felt facilitated our research um, that Maria has also previously emphasized um, as well that we had a lot of prior engagement with stakeholders and continuous feedback which strengthened interest. Ongoing engagement meant that there was a pool of stakeholders from which we could try to maximize representation across stakeholder types, across their regions where they reside, gender and interests. And also within internally our own research team, there was strong collaboration and coordination, which helped us to sequence our research activities in a way that made sense um, and helped to um, coordinate and um, synergize our work. And some lessons learned um, include the use of local facilitators and collaborators, which are essential to approach a large sample of local residents in the surveys that Miguel discussed and also in the workshop. And that online processes, on the other hand, they require a different set of skills and resources. Um, you have to be able to handle multiple platforms of technical issues. And in this sense, an expert facilita facilitator was very helpful in handling this. A local company as, all, as well was uh, useful in, or, in order to enable accurate customization of these streamlined graphic tools. And that in general, having a reflexive process um, and continuous follow-up amongst policymakers and stakeholders, and indeed amongst uh, and within our own research team can help to facilitate future planning processes. So in the future, we plan to engage in further research. We'll compare the exploratory scenarios from the workshop with the uh, visions that were developed in the interviews and in the focus group. Um, we'll examine the different kinds of learning processes that can occur through participatory scenario planning. And we'll look at different visions across our case study areas, comparing Sierra de Guadarrama to Vestrahari and to Denali um, and to Utrecht Hilverberg. 
So that's forward, uh, that's forward thinking to our next steps um, in this research. So I'd like to, to thank you all for your interest. And again, I point you to the website, www.inclusiveconservation.org. So you can access the fact sheet associated with the Sierra de Guadarrama, the solution, and all the other resources from our different case study areas. Thank you very much. And now I think we turn to Maria for the, um, the next building block. Okay, thank you, Vera. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Is, can you confirm if you can see the presentation? Uh, it's still loading. No, it, okay. So, but I have a message. Uh, sorry, I can try again. Now? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, but I'm not sure if I can move the slide because my laptop is uh, thinking. One second, please. You can try with the left and right buttons on your keyboard. Yes, that doesn't that's... work. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Okay, now. Great. <laughs> Okay, thank you again. Um, well, um, I'm going to introduce the building block uh, three. That's uh, as I mentioned previously, this uh, building block uh, includes a set of tools uh, to address um, uh, power, uh, power dynamics, uh, promote uh, collective action um, in governance. So this uh, um, um, in this building block, we can find three different tools that we have live in Sierra de Guadarrama National Park. The first one is uh, refers to an analytical matrix that we use to characterize uh, different types of governance arrangement in this national park. By using these uh, tools, as you can see on the slide, this is a matrix. Um, we classify uh, both formal and um, informal governance arrangement according to two different levels of stakeholder responsibility. This is concentrated versus shared, and two different levels of um, stakeholder influence to achieve the arrangement of different power distribution. And this uh, at inequal versus uh, equal. So by using this uh, tool, uh, we identify uh, four different types of governance arrangement in this national park. That are prescriptive, informative, consultative, and cooperative. Um, the assessment or the classification of this uh, governance arrangement um, was useful to identify challenges for more inclusive conservation in this national park, in this national park, while um, enhancing the existing participatory mechanism in this national park and delineating uh, new ones. Uh, the second tools um, uh, included in this uh, building block um, refers to certain, certain theater-based facilitation techniques uh, that you can can be used uh, in virtual or in-person workshop to address uh, power dynamics between stakeholders. No? Uh, on the slide, you can see an example. It's a barometer, barometer of power that we used in a virtual workshop uh, with uh, stakeholders. Uh, this uh, tool was built and holding um, with the online platform uh, Spatial Chat. And um, by using this uh, tool, stakeholders um, deliberated on the role and power relation between them around conservation governance in order to well, uh, reflect on how, on how this uh, relation can be consolidated uh, to improve collaboration. And the last tool that includes in, in this building block refers to a context uh, specific boundary object that uh, we specifically design within the participatory scenario planning that Veronica mentioned before. And this tool was to focus on, call, on try to call for action no? uh, to, to within this participatory scenario planning. So let me explain uh, this tool in more detail. So, um, you can see on the slide, the, this boundary object uh, approach involves um, a graphical tools uh, that to be used by stakeholders to assess 
their level of willingness to implement collaborative strategies. So as you can see, it's an sound shaped uh, graphical tools that's it divided in six, uh, into six different sections. Each uh, section referred uh, to different stakeholder groups that can be involved in collaborative strategies. On the right uh, section of the slide, you can see a standard scale with six diff different level of stakeholder willingness to, willingness to implement a collaborative strategy and each level have assigned it a different values. So, well, to use uh, this uh, tool within the participatory scenario planning, uh, um, stakeholders uh, are invited to assess their level of willingness to implement a collaborative strategy that has been previously defined by them. To do that, they use the scale uh, of this level of willingness with the values from th three to minus two. So for positive uh, values, um, then the, uh, um, these positive values are then drawn on the exam, combining a, a stakeholder code with a, a gray dot uh, that are being located, is being located in the area of intersection between the stakeholder group uh, to which the stakeholder belongs and the level of willingness selected by each uh, stakeholder. So this action is uh, done for all the stakeholders identified for, um, in a specific collaborative strategy. The union of these uh, values or gray dots uh, results in an area. So th this, uh, well, a bigger area means that a more a major diversity of uh, stakeholder groups are involved in this collaborative strategy. And at the same time that there are uh, or there is a major level of willingness to implement the collaborative strategy uh, by stakeholders. So this latter later is indicative uh, of uh, that there is optimal condition for the strategy can be implemented. Uh, for negative for negative uh, values, the I, um, stakeholder code code is um, combined so is um, combined with a orange X that is located uh, at the center of the axis of the X hound. So these uh, orange X are indicative or an unwillingness uh, by stakeholder towards uh, the definite uh, strategy. So this can, can this may be by due to different causes uh, such as a lack of motivation for the strategy, uh, but also for existence of tension, disagreements, or maybe absence of resources. Uh, and then on the next slide, you can see different, uh, well, it's a real example that the result that we um, identified during our participatory scenario planning exercise. So you can see that using, by using this uh, graphical tool or these boundary objects, uh, um, the stakeholder or the strategies were assessed and we identified different forms and different patterns of collaboration between stakeholders. So we, during our research, we found that uh, these uh, graphical tools um, help us to um, visualize uh, the results graphically as a proxy of the potential willingness to move from theory to practice. So regarding the well, enabling factors, uh, well, we found through our research that uh, this uh, type of graphical tool or this uh, specific approach can be used within the deliberative processes where uh, especially those that are um, focused on social learning and knowledge co-production approaches in which uh, stakeholders can deliberate about conservation issues and challenges and they can define strategies so to move or to, to address uh, these uh, challenges. So and in this context, uh, this tool can, um, can, uh, can be uh, useful to call for action. Um, specifically, we uh, or result or result revealed that uh, this boundary object is um, or can be considered as a, an innovative, innovative and complementary method to the participatory scenario planning workshop um, approach, uh, being especially useful to call for collective uh, action. 
Um, regarding the lesson, well, we found that uh, the assessment of a stakeholder willingness uh, is um, to implement collaborative strategies is a crucial factor to guide collective function. Um, regarding the specific role that the voluntary object played uh, within the deliberative process uh, for participatory scenario planning, we um, found that uh, the, this tool uh, have proved to be in, um, uh, the, of great, uh, great help in three main areas. The first one in um, identifying intra and uh, inter-stakeholder uh, group collaboration to move from theory to practice. Second one, uh, in clarifying how the different stakeholders uh, can contribute to implement the, the collaborative strategy from uh, their own firework. And finally, in facilitating a culture of shared responsibility to, to implement the collaborative strategy, or in other words, to facilitate collective action. Uh, regarding the um, tools applicability, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, the workshop that we conducted with decisions maker, they express that the specific tool has uh, the potential applicability within the management setting of the Sierra de Guadarrama uh, National Park. Indeed, uh, they express uh, that uh, this tool can support the current uh, participatory voluntary program uh, of this uh, national park. Uh, and they recognized that uh, that in order that uh, this tool can be used by them, uh, financial and human, and human resource, building capacity and institutional leadership uh, are essential factors to achieve that. Um, finally, well, we found as another benefit uh, to apply these tools is that uh, can be used as a template and can be adapted to call and facilitate collective action in other protected areas uh, around the world. And um, just to finish my presentation, to say that uh, you can find more information about the other tools that are included in this building block, um, the enabling factors and the lesson that we have learned during the vision project um, in, on the Panorama website uh, within our building block. Uh, thank you all for your attention. I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Maria. Yes, we do have some questions. And I think that now we have a little bit of time, like uh, 22 minutes exactly, until the end of the webinar. So we are going to tackle these questions. Uh, there, is, there was one first question uh, from Mark Infield from Ashton Forest in Southeast England that was responded already in the chat, but I'm just going to mention it here because it could be interesting for everybody and maybe you have not seen the chat. He was asking about how were the values that respondents, respondents selected presented, as if it was a pre-prepared list of generated or of generated from the respondents themselves. Uh, Veronica, you responded to the question, but you might want to also add something here. Thanks, um, Alberto, for bringing that up. And thank you so much, Mark, for, for that question. It's a very good question. Um, how do we come up with these values? Um, and the answer is that, well, we actually used a framework that has been used um, previously uh, for locally perceived values that people hold for landscape. Um, and it's based on social cultural perception of landscape function. Uh, but we ha also had adapted this to the context of the Sierra Guadarrama Park. And we had piloted um, the interview script and asked some um, some some of these values questions in uh, in a way to test them and the way that people uh, received the question. And so um, we were able to, um, yeah, to refine our interview script. And we found that this was actually one of the uh, interview questions that respondents, that participants responded most readily to. Um, maybe Maria has something to add because uh, she was also conducting many of these interviews. No, but I think that's a due response. Uh, it's, uh, okay, so I agree with you. <clears throat> And I think that the streamlined canvas actually really helped uh, with that in the way that, in the sense that uh, made the rankings very, very easy and helped to spark a bit of uh, creativity. Uh, just for context, this was in the midst of uh, a two hour long um, interview. So having some visual elements was quite refreshing, actually, I think for some of the stakeholders. Thank you very much, Vero. There is a second question that I saw that you also tried to respond that maybe it's good also to raise it here in the group. It's from Ney Moreira. I do not have more information. 
about uh, her, but uh, for sure, most of the participants here are uh, practitioners and people working on protected areas. So we can assume that people have a knowledge and her, no her question is actually related with something quite specific. How could we measure the efficacy of biodiversity corridors between national parks or conservation units? I don't know who would like to respond to this, maybe even Chris himself. Yeah, that's a really, uh, it's an interesting question. It's also a complex question. I think in, uh, when you talk about efficacy, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, conservation effectiveness, which is dealing with issues of uh, uh, habitat connectivity, species diversity, etc. That's not a specific question we looked at in, in vision. Rather, we're looking at that more, more interested in how do we engage diverse stakeholders uh, in terms of their visions for protected area management. So biodiversity was considered as a, a, a value and as a vision, but not systematically assessed in that way. But I, in, in, in terms of your general question, um, in separate research, we have brought together ecological maps around priorities for management with habitat connectivity with some of the visions and social values uh, elicited through techniques similar to Envision to actually look at what are socially acceptable and ecologically defensible areas for, for protected area management. So those tools do exist, but not, not, we're not a focus of the Envision project. So thanks, Alberto. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I have another question from Xiaohua Wang. Especially wonderful presentations, especially the methodology you presented. Would you please give more details about your coding process? For example, the team coding or solo coding, inductive or detective? Quite curious about it. Who would like to answer this question? Maybe Miguel? I, I hear Miguel. Maybe this question relates more to the to the work of Veronica and the, from the stakeholders and interviews. As she mentioned already, that she used an inductive process to build this uh, variety of, of visions. But maybe Veronica, you want to add something else there? Just unmute myself. Thank you. Thanks for that um, that question. It's it's a it's a good question, um, and I thought that didn't want to come up actually because uh, it's maybe not something that everybody is familiar with. Um, but certainly, team members here have um, you know helped me on this process. So um, it was an inductive uh, thematic coding um, uh, process, as Miguel has um, has just described. And it's an iterative process. So what it involves is taking um, all of the different um, interview transcripts. And then we used an open source software called RQDA that's used on another open source software, R. And so that means it's free and available for everybody to use. Um, and what you can do is upload the transcripts and you read through the, the interview script and um, you can highlight key code words and you can uh, go back iteratively and refine um, what these different codes are and look at the frequency of codes and see if they align with uh, uh, with different themes. And this is the way that we derived the, the major um, visions. And then amongst the research team um, ourselves, of course, we sort of cross-validated the, the results um, with each other. So it was solo um, validated by internally within the research team. And that's how we, we did that. Mm -hmm. And anyone else is free to also add to that, as you're all involved in the research too. <laughs> I'll, I'll just add that across the whole project, uh, Envision combines uh, inductive and deductive techniques through our multi-method approaches. So what was largely presented today, particularly through Maria's and Veronica's work was inductive, but some of Miguel's work was a little bit more deductive, drawing upon survey research. Uh, and across the project, we have a range of different inductive and de deductive techniques to more deeply explore and examine uh, the effectiveness of inclusive conservation approaches. Thank you very much. I have another question. This time we only have anonymous participant. 
I will read it and maybe something that Miguel could help or actually maybe also Maria and Perez for everybody probably. A key issue to achieve biodiversity targets is an adequate implementation related with, this is very much related with ownership of the targets by sectors. Inclusivity here for sure will help. Will you say that this way of collecting information from stakeholders helped in enhancing this ownership? I don't know if uh, maybe Miguel would like to jump in. Uh, sorry, Alberto, I cannot hear you so well. Maybe you can repeat quickly the question. Oh, excuse me. Maybe there was a connection issue then. Okay. I will summarize the question. They're uh, talking about the need to ensure that implementation is better in future to ensure we achieve the biodiversity targets, which is very much related with the ownership of the targets by the different sectors. So the question is uh, whether inclusivity for sure will help but if you will say that this way, this methodology to collect information from stakeholders was helpful in enhancing this ownership of the targets by the different stakeholders. Yes, well, this is really important and relevant at the moment, especially with the targets and the, and the agenda of um, to 2013. But yes, this, uh, this, um, this, we basically use many, many, many tools and methods here, so we, we cannot just um, what we can we can frame all in, in inclusive conservation, but we have if used different approaches, not only in Sierra de Guadarrama, but in other sites. And, and this has triggered many processes of trust, partnerships, and ownership of, of the of the goals. And recognize and we have uh, recognized the multi, uh, a multitude of values and knowledge systems uh, taking place in this uh, in this area. And this we believe for sure that has brought uh, sort of uh, ownership of, of, of the diets um, in many ways uh, from the social from a social perspective, but also from an ecological perspective. Um, so we believe that this is this is a, what is been happening. It's also what what we we have presented somehow here in the in, in with this tool and and the other tool happening in the other sides. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, we have a very specific question now in the chat also from Borja Heredia. The, it's about the wolf. The wolf is present in the Guadarrama National Park. How can the tools help manage human wildlife conflict within the park? Maria, maybe? I can try to answer that. Well, I think that uh, all the conflicts uh, can try to solve or at least uh, address through deliberative processes to reflect uh, collectively about the, um, the, the conflict and the tension of the national park. Uh, well, I think that this national park um, at, at this moment um, doesn't have enough um, deliberative spaces or social spaces to share uh, all the, or to address all the tension that uh, there are there. But uh, decisions makers are working on that and try to, to apply or to build these social spaces, um, um, apply uh, some methods to, to address this uh, tension. So I think I, I know that uh, the, the wolf is a big uh, issue uh, and they are in National Park, but from the rally. From my knowledge, uh, this uh, conflict is not yet uh, addressed um, from a perspective for uh, inclusive conservation where all stakeholders can debate and deliberate on this issue. Thank you very much, Maria. And I don't see more questions at the moment. Can I just uh, I'll put to try maybe elaborate on the question before around uh, uh, empowerment and engagement because it was one of the starting drivers of this project. So the birds and habitats directive, which guides uh, a lot of the conservation of natura sites across Europe, uh, has a, a fitness check every four to six years, and one of, and a, a series of fitness tests checks have highlighted that while the amount of natural sites are increasing across Europe, uh, 
stakeholder ownership of those protected areas is not necessarily increasing in terms of a willingness to get involved in different conservation initiatives, et cetera. So that was one of the big gaps that we started to try to address and envision. How do we actually build in ownership through new tool development, through methods developments that can enable different stakeholders to have a voice and to uh, not only share their vision, but better understand some of the trade-offs associated with protected area management going forward. Um, and I think a range of our tools do spotlight those ownership issues in different ways, um, recognising that they're not always win-wins, they're also trade-offs uh, in terms of winners and losers across different groups. And uh, uh, in some cases, balancing those is not necessarily possible. And so we're really looking at how do we uh, manage those trade-offs in new ways, as well as managing those synergies with the goal of empowering different voices. So that was just elaboration on that really important question, Alberto. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and actually, I think that that's uh, maybe a nice way to conclude this webinar. Now to have a ray of light in terms of the challenges to implement the future biodiversity targets and the uh, role that inclusive conservation can play in this context. And with this, I would like to have to thank very much the speakers and also to all the attendees for your attention and for your participation. You can get more information about the Envision project on the website. You have the link in the chat. I think it has been copied at least two times. And would you have any additional questions anyway, please do feel free to get in touch with us. Have a very good rest of the day and enjoy the evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.